Conglomenian Chronicles by General Leonard T. Kranz. 3. The Outpost in Trosnotsky Square. January 16th. With our small makeshift setup arranged on the village square of Trosnotsky, a many spoke to Uber nexus of road meetage, reinforcements from the Borjak outside Conglomenia have had the enemies at one area of the Conglomenian border force boxed in. I sent a small party of men, led by veteran of General Source-based combat Axel Majumbe, to intimidate the rear sides of the Conglo border defences. Axel left Trosnotsky with five tons of TNT and a rancid rat. It took less of a time to reach the border running, and Axel's squad reached it in under two hours. When they got there, our friendly kebab tanks had already parked outside the wall, and were all practicing three-point turns and cockpit drills. Axel pointed to the nearest sniper tower on his side, and his grenadier threw a rancid rat up into it. I am told that with hysterical fear and laughing came the response of the sentry on duty in the tower, who then hung, limp-tongued, with his head sagging out of the tower. The rat returned to the squad and was put into a cellophane bag with some mints to keep him fresh and rancid. Now that there was no guard at the end of the wall, although other towers further down the hill were on watch, Axel used his demolitions man to blow the wall. In an explosion shaped like a Monte Carlo hooker, the wall gave way to colourful fire and masonry combusted. Later, the kebab tanks, whose drivers had obviously finally got their seatbelts on after much kerfuffling, broke through the wall and Axel hitched a ride with the armoured cavalry's new commander. The commander, a hard-jawed, mustachioed, grinning chunk master in a squashed cowboy hat, arrived in Trosnotsky Square that afternoon on a column of kebab tanks. Axel had taken the liberty on the journey of requiring some petroleum flowers from the ground so that fuel would be plentiful, and the tanks set up a defensive cordon around us. I congratulated Axel Majumbe on breaking through the border walls, and awarded him a buzzard swathed in the finest Velcro bird clothes. He blushed abashedly, and stuck the hawk to his chest, which squawked like an arrogant jazzman. I greeted tank commander Rancheur de la Buffalo as he arrived, and bowed to his superior knowledge and taste in rare cheeses. He clearly exceeded his station of the most important man here, and we listened intently to his orders and drunken rants as if they were gospel. I distinctly remember his orders with clarity. He explained, We should take the southern to where the Conglomenians are building a new church of gospel and worship. Their fourth favourite god, Chucksos, you should provide cover to our tanks because it is well known that a tank is weak and always requires escort and shielding from our soldiers on foot only wearing cardigans which I will of course supply you with. As he finished, his ears turned inside out. There was no problem with my platoon following Captain Buffalo into battle, except he wore his hat on backwards, which made them feel suicidal. We took the elks off their holsters and packed them away into our rucksacks, ready to form a protective arc of men in front of the tanks. It was up to us to form human shields in case someone were to fire a bullet at the tanks, thus ruining their newly polished surface. Also, Axel employed his Velcro buzzard to sponge down the track skirts of our tanks to remove unsightly mud. There is nothing our enemy fears more than the cleanliness of good presentation. On our way to the church, through ruined Trosnowski town, Jiminy Alesnail pointed out to me a rare and peculiar wildlife occurrence. Three salamanders were seen in the high atmosphere, at first lit up like dots. They were re-entering Earth's atmosphere, their faces momentarily aflame. And then, casually resuming their dark, shiny appearance, flocking back towards their migratory seasonal home in fork spasm. A beautiful sight, and very rare to see them returning from their winter retreat on the asteroid N667 Beta Fallopian Tube. Our astronomers are still trying to work out what these miraculous salamanders do on the asteroid during the month of December, but have so far ascertained small details, such as the fact that it must involve dice. After ten minutes of breathless tabbing, 
we reached the under construction Church of Chuxos. The builders saw us coming, dropped their schematics and ran. Although on their sprint away from us, one disturbed the nestling hole of a sleeping buttock viper, which darted viciously out and fanged said worker in his lower rear protrusions, dragging him angrily underground. For a moment, I regarded the Conglomenians with jealousy, whilst looking upon the visage of their church. Indeed, the architecture is exquisite, and we had nothing in my home nation of Kebabnia to match it. A detailed and sophisticated monument devoted to worshipping their faith, so sublime and so perfect it made my knees weak. After conferring with Rancher de Le Buffalo, we both unanimously agreed that it had to be destroyed. But we had to do it with as much respect as possible. We maintain an expression of sheer disgust on our faces the entire time we were napalming the structure, as this was the correct procedure for maiming something so beautiful without acknowledging it was ever beautiful. I told my men they would do well to put any sense of awe out of their minds so they could better concentrate on stamping Conglomenian butterflies into the mud and ripping Conglomenian rabbits' heads off, as they were not like the rabbits of our Kebabnia but a horrendous abomination of rabbit raised in a country across the sea from us which automatically instilled in its cute face and ears an aura of killer malevolence. I was proved right in prescribing this philosophy to my men, when just behind the church I saw a member of a brigade not under my command nestling a wounded Conglomenian squirrel. You there, put it down, said I to the bearded junior officer whose saddened and empathising expression said it all. My bullet skinned its back. Look at what senselessness I have wrought, sir. It is weak. It cannot survive, unless... And to my dismay, his sentence was cut off, as he had not noticed the squirrel's head growing to eight times its normal size, sharper inner teeth extending, and powerful neck muscles launching the enormous squirrel head into a ferocious movement, Mirroring many articulated cranes you might see in downtown New York. It lunged, its vice-like jaw enveloping the sympathetic officer's head and devouring it off his neck. Damned fool! I shouted, immediately putting down the murderous wildlife with my Colt .82 Jarkler pistol. Later, I rounded up my men, and they encircled the scene of the deaths. I told them this is why anything beautiful in Conglomenia was actually lying and manipulative at best, and I believe my brigade learnt a valuable lesson from this. Unfortunately, while I was mentoring my men in a huddle, they had not been defending the tank column. On the wasteland by the field, Rancher, in his lead tank, had been killed when, upon noticing a bit of red paint had been scraped off the side of his lead vehicle after he'd driven past the thorns of some bramble bushes, had a panic attack and a seizure when he realised he did not bring any pots of paint to repair the damage. Many in his column suffered similar deaths when the excretions of pigeons landed on the bonnet. A snail had crossed in front of a vehicle, forcing it to drive over its snail trail and thus sully its tracks, and when the rear tank drove past a bakery and coated itself in the smell of bread, conglomenian bread, thus rendering it disgusting and an offence to our home nations, although seeming to smell quite nice, but in a foreign way and therefore not actually smelling nice due to it not being baked within our patriotic nation. At the sight of this, Maltus McClaw nearly broke down in a song of woe. Oh, conglomenia! Beauty thou hast not, O Conglomenia, thou hast fakest the lot. The sweetness, sparkle, joy, and love looks the same as ours, but is just fluff. A facade painted so discreetly, yonder pretty face lurks something beastly. I suggested we sent the tanks back to the coast until we have enough human shields and cleaners or polishers to properly defend them from the dangers of not looking a hundred percent pristine at all times. I took my platoon out across the wasteland beyond the church, now left to our own devices again.